Well, hello, everybody, uh, and thank you for taking the time to come to this uh, session. I'm Don Goldman, uh, a, a Chief Scientific Officer Emeritus and Senior Fellow at IHI, and I'm really pleased to be joined today by Shannon Welsh, uh, who's a Senior Project Director at IHI, and she'll be coming on camera and giving part of the presentation in a little bit. Well, you're looking at me, so you realize I'm a somewhat aging white guy. Uh, and just to be totally transparent, I'm in the midst of lifelong learning uh, about equity. So I'm going to do my very best based on my learning. Always interested in getting feedback uh, if in some way or other you think I'm not uh, representing your uh, lived experience. So uh, I'm going to be a little bit dry here and start with some key definitions because I find that people throw around terms and don't necessarily have a clear definition. So uh, what do, uh, does equity mean and what does equality mean? Well, health equity is when all people have the opportunity to attain their full health potential and no one is disadvantaged from achieving that potential because of their social position or other socially determined uh, circumstances. This requires a clear focus on population health and to bring in specifically poor and marginalized uh, populations. Health inequity is a difference or disparity in health outcomes that is systematic, avoidable, and most importantly, unjust. And it's important to realize that not every disparity or difference uh, is unjust, and we have to keep in mind the difference between uh, just having a disparity and having an unjust disparity. And equality is not the same as equity, and I invite you to take a look at these images. Uh, on the uh, left, you can see uh, equality. Everybody has the same size uh, riser to stand on, uh, but they have different needs because the ground and the fence uh, are not uh, the same all along the uh, image. Equity raises up the people who can't see so that they can see as well. Everybody has an equal opportunity to see, but when you think about it, that doesn't necessarily deal with injustice. And the best way to deal with injustice is to level the playing field uh, one way or another, tear down that fence so you don't need to provide additional uh, elevation uh, to that person on the right who's trying to see. This is another image from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that I find useful. And you can just study this. You can see that giving everybody the same bicycle isn't gonna help that kid and isn't gonna help that individual who has a disability. So every time I give a talk, regardless of the topic, uh, I bring in this famous statement by Martin Luther King, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Because I really believe that we talk a lot about the cost curve. We're always bending the cost curve, but we also need to bend uh, that justice curve. And I like to emphasize that Martin Luther King actually adapted this uh, statement uh, from Theodore Parker, who was a preacher, uh, and he brought in the importance of faith. And as you know, MLK was deeply faithful man. And, and what Theodore Parker said is on this slide. And uh, I just want to emphasize this is coming from basic human values, uh, not uh, just off the top of the head as an intellectual construct. So how do you think we're doing at bending the equity curve towards justice? Uh, I hear a lot about value, that cost quality uh, equation, but it's really important to say what's behind that? What are the values, be they faith-based or simply humanistic? And I still remember standing in line at a coffee shop uh, in London pre-COVID, and I was talking to somebody from the NHS and she said, well, I'm not so interested in the value you Americans keep talking about. We're here in the UK, we're interested in values. And, and uh, I, I trust that's uh, the case and hope it's the case. Here's some more important uh, definitions I'd like you to consider. Race is a socially constructed grouping of people based on their physical characteristics, which may include color, may include ethnicity, language, religion, other arbitrary categories, but the important point that uh, the definitions of race will vary depending on who you are and where you live, but it's always about social dominance and hierarchy. I distinguish this from genetic or biologic ancestry. I'm actually really interested in where people come from, what their real uh, genetic background is, because 
uh, there are a lot of conditions and diseases that actually are associated uh, with genetic uh, predisposition. If you uh, come from Africa, your chances of having a sickle cell gene are much higher. If you're Jewish like me, I worry about certain congenital diseases and inflammatory bowel disease. So I am interested in where people are from, but not about their physical characteristics that arbitrarily define who they are. Racism uh, is a uh, important uh, concept, which is a system for structuring opportunity and value based on how one looks, such as race, and unfairly disadvantages some populations and unfairly advantages others. And I, you see, I've adapted this from a colleague at, uh, here at uh, Harvard. Structural and systemic racism and implicit con unconscious bias also really important. Uh, I've had uh, kind of a, a, a hard time getting my arms around structural and systemic racism because I've not been a victim of it. But uh, it's the normalization and legitimization of historical injustice and policy choices that routinely and systematically advantage white people while producing cumulative and chronically adverse outcomes uh, for black people. Uh, and we'll talk some about that in, in just a minute. And then there's implicit or unconscious bias, and you can read that definition. You've probably heard a lot about this and examine your own beliefs and how you act and for your own un unconscious biases. But the important point here is that in general, even though they're deeply ingrained and socially reinforced, they are often learned. And because they're learned, they can be unlearned. And that, that's something that I'd really like you to think about and remember. So as I said, I've struggled with systemic or structural racism, trying to really understand it. And I got my fundamental understanding by studying housing in the United States. Uh, and uh, there's a wonderful book uh, called The Color of Law that really goes through all the laws and policies uh, that have led to discriminatory housing in the United States. Uh, here's an ad uh, for a, a wonderful a new development on the lakefront in Hennepin County. Uh, and you can see uh, outlined in green there that they're not interested in having any Moorish, Turkish, Negro, Mongolian, Semitic, or African blood or descent in their community. And these kinds of restrictions or covenants were widespread in the United States before the Supreme Court uh, uh, outlawed them uh, uh, back in the 50s, as I recall. But that doesn't mean that ways around the Supreme Court ruling don't persist in our society that lead to exclusion of people who are deemed by uh, somebody as undesirable, or perhaps they'll bring down property values. Well, here, here's an example of bringing down property, property values called redlining in Detroit. And, and this was a systematic way to undervalue uh, properties where a lot of black folks happen to live. And this was reflected in whether or not those people could get a loan from our housing authority or, or uh, other uh, mechanisms that people would need to get a mortgage or get a loan. And this systematically, of course, restricted what black people could buy and how they could accumulate wealth through owning uh, housing and property. And you can see this has real consequences. Here are the wealth disparities uh, in Boston, where the region where I live. You can see, and this really just bowled me over when I saw it. This is no fake news. This is the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. African-American wealth, all total wealth, including the property, the housing, the debt in Boston is $8. For white people, it's almost $250,000. You can see other data here as well. This is striking. I really encourage you, wherever you live, be it in London, near Tower Hamlets, wherever you are, look at wealth disparities in your community, which may be based on different factors than being black or white, depending on your country and your region. Another uh, uh, issue that is a consequence of this kind of disparity and inequity, average life expectancy in Chicago. Uh, look, at, look at the difference here. We're talking about 10, 15 or more years, depending on whether you live in regions uh, like this or whether you're in wealthier uh, regions here in the green. This is really striking and has real consequences uh, for uh, uh, people depending on how they're designated racially or culturally or ethnically. Uh, I, I always point out that uh, being Jewish, that there's a tendency to think about other isms. 
And when I talk to people who are of Arab descent or uh, people who may uh, be Muslim or uh, in this day and age with COVID in the United States being from China, there are a lot of isms that we need to take into account. We focus on racism here in the United States because it's such a persistent historical traumatic problem going back all the way to the uh, when enslaved people were were brought here but these other isms are important too uh, and it's it's really necessary for us to think in terms of our basic humanity and values uh, so that everyone is not treated as an ism and discriminated against uh, uh, in an unwarranted and unjust fashion i really like this uh, change in the uh, six principles of quality improvement that you're probably familiar with. These are the Institute of Medicine are now called the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, six principles, you, you know, safe care, effective care, timely care, patient family centeredness, and efficiency. And it used to include in this list of six equity. But in a, in a way, uh, e even though it's important to have it in the list, equity is a driver of everything. It's a driver of the value of care. It's a driver of all these other components, including what's been added, access to care, which is so important. And it spans all the kinds of care we give, preventive care, acute treatment, chronic disease management. This is really an important reframing, I think, that it puts equity where it needs to be at the beginning of your journey to improving uh, patient care and health. Uh, a friend of mine and a former fellow, Matt Stiefel, uh, had this wonderful conceptual model of population health. And where did he start? He started here with equity. Why did he start with equity? Because this is the entire population, it's not some cherry picked population that happens to be in some uh, insurance plan or private health system. It's all the people. And if you don't start from equity, if you don't have equity for everybody, you'll never achieve uh, population health. And of course, this brings in all kinds of what we call social and environmental or upstream uh, determinants that really govern people's health uh, over the long term. And I've listed a lot of them here, including what I just talked about, housing security, the built environment where you live. I've recently become really focused on pollution and environmental contamination. I had not heard of something in the United States called fence line communities. What are fence line communities? They're places that no one will inhabit except the poorest of the poor who have no choice, living near oil refineries and toxic waste dumps. Uh, uh, people in Philadelphia who live near the big oil refineries and those tanks that I pass on my way to visit uh, family uh, in, in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, we know that the health outcomes there are much worse than they would be if you lived in a suburb of Philadelphia. And those people have little choice. Their property is undervalued. It's really hard for them to move, even if they have a decent job. A couple more definitions, cultural competency. This is what uh, we teach throughout the United States. It's part of our fabric of healthcare. Uh, how do you have skills to deal with groups of people uh, who are different than you? What's the problem here? The problem is that you tend to categorize people sometimes by socially con social constructs or arbitrary categories, and then you become competent in dealing with them. That's so sterile. My goodness, I don't want to be competent. I want to be really uh, humane and I want to understand. I want to be humble. I want to learn. I want to be curious. And you can see that my favorite expression now is I want to achieve cultural humility, which is a lifelong journey for people who don't have the, the lived experience uh, of the folks coming in to see you in a clinic, an office or a hospital. There's some really important communication requirements that come from this. Uh, it, it involves a level of trust. It involves cultural humility and humanity, but there are other things that matter too. A shared language, uh, uh, consistent providers, uh, uh, people who look like you, uh, sensitivity to health literacy. All this is required if you're really going to have shared decisions, shared goals, support for self-management, and most importantly, co-production with the people we serve. I, I'm always encouraging people to think uh, who are in who are in healthcare? Who are the people we serve? Are they the people that just happen to come to our door, or are they all the people in the community in which we live and work, uh, where our hospital uh, is located, where our private practice is located, whatever it may be? 
uh, who are all of the people we serve, whether or not they can make it in the office uh, for an office visit. Well, where did this idea of race come from? Uh, you know, it's important to understand the origin of something as arbitrary and destructive as the concept of race. It's actually a noxious stew of social Darwinism, if you remember back to your uh, high school or, or, or university education. Physical anthropology, the characteristics of your skull, how big is your nose, how big are your ears, how, how do you stand? Eugenics, uh, which is the elimination of people through selective survival and who you uh, elect not to uh, survive uh, so that you build a quote unquote fit race. And all this leads to race science, uh, which is a pseudo scientific basis for categorizing people according to their physical characteristics, including skin color. Uh, I've been trying to figure out, well, who's the first person to really describe this? And you read different books, you get different people. I was struck by Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. Uh, he was one of the fathers of physical anthropology and studied the crania. You can see his drawings down here of the crania and he, he cranium and he divided uh, the races in the Caucasian, Mongolian, Malayan, Ethiopian and American. And you can see the corresponding colors. And you look at what he said about this, it was a degenerative hypothesis. Adam and Eve were white, and, and we all know that, right? God is white, Adam and Eve were white. Uh, but what he said was the environment, sun exposure, nutrition, etc., degenerated people from Adam and Eve so that they became these other races. Well, it's interesting. He's actually saying this is not genetically predetermined. And he maintained that no race is inferior, everybody deserves equal opportunity. That part was forgotten. Uh, he's absolutely right. When you assign people uh, in the different categories and you say it's the environment in which they're exposed, obviously it's not just the sun, uh, but if you, if you categorize people that way and say they have equal opportunity, that at least is a pathway towards equity. Uh, but that part of his teaching was forgotten uh, by people like Madison Grant. You may remember our last uh, uh, president, the 45th president, or as uh, President Biden likes to say, the former guy, was very happy to have immigrants from Norway, but not so happy to have people from the S four letter word, poor nations of Africa. Well, where did he get that idea? Well, it's because Madison Grant and, and others uh, were extraordinarily popular uh, back in the beginning of the 20th century. This is Madison Grant's uh, book, The Passing of the Great Race. And who are these folks here who are trying to infiltrate uh, Europe and, and get down towards the Black Sea? They are the Nordic uh, people. Uh, and of course, they are white and of a certain type. And he believed that this was the future of mankind. For mankind to be saved, we had to uh, have a Nordic infiltration uh, that would uh, supersede uh, using eugenics, actually. And you can see a quote from here down uh, at the bottom, a rigid system of selection to eliminate those who are weak or unfit so that we have a more Nordic and Aryan uh, population. So uh, I say all this, every time I say it, I, I have to check myself because I hate saying this. Uh, I, I mean, I hope you understand, I'm not giving any credence or trying to perpetuate this point of view. I'm just trying to look at the historical way in which we arrived at the current uh, system uh, of inequity that we have today. Uh, I, I recently became interested in what the tools were that people like uh, 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 Madison Grant and others used to study the so-called races. And I've come across a number of uh, skin tone charts. Uh, when I first Googled this, uh, I got actually skin tone for cosmetics, uh, whole kinds of wheels you could look at to match your skin tone to the, to the cosmetics. But when you dig a little deeper, this is what was used by a guy named Felix von Luchan uh, to classify relative whiteness and who was mixed race. You, you know, uh, in the United States, we became obsessed with uh, how many fractions of black blood do you have and you categorize people. And in Brazil today, for example, which I thought was an ecumenical and tolerant society, it's just as important. What is your skin tone? How much blackness do you have in your skin that leads to inequity? So uh, it, it's you don't have to look hard to find uh, the pernicious nature of this uh, history. And of course, this kind of fake race science uh, was very instrumental in the conduct of the 
infamous Tuskegee syphilis study in black men in Alabama, uh, who for 40 years, despite the arrival of penicillin, and, and even when there was relatively effective though toxic treatment with arsenicals, were just observed to see how their syphilis would progress because they were uh, thought of as a degenerate uh, race who didn't know better and wouldn't be able to take care of themselves and wouldn't uh, accept treatment even if given. And I'm not going to go into this today. It would be an entirely different lecture, but it's one of the blots uh, on our history in the United States. And you can see President Clinton here, although you can't see his face, that's President Clinton uh, hugging one of the survivors and making a formal apology on behalf of the United States. Uh, we had to do it again later because my uh, colleague and friend Susan Reverby found that we were doing syphilis studies, uh, not just observing people, but inoculating people uh, in, uh, in Guatemala with syphilis to see how they did. And we had the President Obama uh, apologize for that abomination uh, more recently. Well, what can we as an improvement community do about inequity, including racism? I get asked this all, all the time, just uh, over Memorial Day weekend here, I was asked by uh, my sister-in-law, well, what, she's the head of a foundation, what can we do to undo racism? And the one thing I wanna be sure uh, that I say loud and clear, it's not just about raising all boats. There's this common problematic assumption that I still hear that if we just use QI, we'll raise all the boats, everybody will get better. That does not work. In fact, time and time again, we found that a, uh, a quality improvement program that is blind to the needs of individual populations that we're trying to serve will just increase gaps. Uh, everybody may improve, but black people tend to improve just a little bit and white people tend to improve a lot. And, and the same is true for Latinx people and other uh, minority and underserved populations. So you've got to proactively address those components of the population. Reducing inequity or the determinants of inequity is not a quality improvement project. It's part of a larger effort. Uh, and I like to talk about this as being simultaneous and a uh, clear effort at six different levels. The community as a whole, individuals and families who live in that community, the providers, the nurses, the doctors, and others who care for them clinically, the microsystem, nice you know, quality improvement jargon, but just a small unit of care delivery like a clinic or a ward of a hospital, the macro system, more jargon, the whole healthcare delivery organization or healthcare delivery system that houses those microsystems, and most importantly, policy, payment, regulation, and accreditation, which are part of the structural integrated components that right now are leading to injustice. And I want to, I ask myself every day, and I ask all of my colleagues, I ask you, which spheres are you addressing or planning to address in your comprehensive multifactorial approach to reducing uh, uh, inequity. And um, uh, I may come back to this when we talk to co about COVID if we have time at the end, but I want to at least uh, put it up there for you to consider. And now I'm gonna turn it over uh, to uh, Shannon Welsh, who's done so much to educate me and improve my learning, and which I, I deeply appreciate. And I'll thank you publicly now, Shannon. So uh, your turn. Oh, thank you so much, Don, and good afternoon, everyone. It's such an honor to be able to spend this time with you together today. So I'd like to begin by first talking about the Improving Health Equity Framework. And this came from a white paper that was published in 2016 on strategies that healthcare organizations can take to improve health equity. And so you'll see improving health equity is at the center. And in order to do that, we have to one, make health equity a strategic priority. And then we have to build the infrastructure to support the health equity work. And while we're doing that, we also have to be aware and mindful to address the multiple determinants of health. As Don has shared in his presentation thus far, there's a lot of factors that come into play. And then we also need to eliminate racism and other forms of oppression and partner with the community to improve health equity. So on the next slide, I wanna go a little bit deeper into some specific examples of how this might play out. So in making health equity a strategic priority, 
It's so key and important for leadership, senior leadership, to demonstrate a commitment to improving equity at all levels of the organization. And also look at ways to secure sustainable funding through new payment models. And then for the second piece to develop the structure and the processes to support health equity work, one idea is to establish a governance committee that's responsible for the oversight and management of equity work across the organization, and also to dedicate resources in the budget to support equity work. And then for the third component, as we look to display deploy specific strategies to address the multiple determinants of health, it's important to look at a variety of factors. As, as Don has mentioned earlier, you can look at socioeconomic status as an example, um, the physical environment in which people live. Do they have housing security? Or do they have food security? And the and physical environment that they are living in. And then at the same time, we also have to realize the need to address and decrease institutional racism within the organization. So, for example, taking a look perhaps at the health insurance plans that are accepted by the organization and then also reducing implicit bias within organizational policies, structures and norms and also in patient care and how it is delivered. And I'll share a little bit more about that on a future slide. And then lastly, developing partnerships with community organizations. There's great um, a wealth of assets within the community and specifically within the patient population that we serve. And so it's important to work together on community issues related to improving health equity. Now on the next slide, there's a driver diagram and I'll share a little bit about the pursuing equity work that we are doing in the US for um, with IHI. And this you'll see includes the five components of the framework that I mentioned before as the primary drivers. And there's a lot of information here on the slide, but just I'll hone in on a few examples. So in making equity a strategic priority, um, in addition to having senior leadership ownership for making that work a priority, having equity as a priority in the organizational strategic plans and specific department level goals are key. And then another piece on building the infrastructure, it is so key to create the data infrastructure to be able to improve health equity. Because as Don mentioned before, in QI related work, if we're not honing in and understanding the experience of care and where there may be differences in process, whether it's by race or ethnicity, language, or other factors, we have to be able to have the data to see that picture of what's happening at the specific process level. And so then we're able to start to address multiple determinants of health by one, identifying the inequities in clinical care by having that data infrastructure, and also perhaps screening for the social determinants of health and ensure that patients have access to social services to meet their needs. And then also improving health equity throughout the entire healthcare system, and also thinking beyond clinical care services. And when it comes to eliminating racism and other forms of oppression, Actually, addressing institutional racism and the impact on health equity through culture and communication. As Don mentioned before, communication, that piece is so key and approaching the work from a place of humility, having cultural humility. Um, also, understanding the historical context for racism and other forms of oppression. And then also looking at ways to improve specific clinical processes to narrow equity gaps and make improvements for all. And then lastly, on partnering with the community, actually investing in community organizations is, is one idea to help address social determinants of health. And so now on this last slide that I'm gonna share, I wanna give some very specific examples from the pursuing equity teams in the first round of this work. And so first I'll share a little bit about pursuing equity. This is a project that we have where we have currently 23 health systems across the United States and one in Canada who have come together to see how they can improve equity within their organizations. And they are all focusing on one clinical topic where they wanna narrow equity gaps, as well as a strategic topic of focus. And so from the first round of pursuing equity, here's a sampling of how some of the participating teams were able to apply each component of the framework to their work. 
So health partners in Bloomington, Minnesota, they were able to make health equity a strategic priority by embedding it into their annual plans. But additionally, to ensure that there was the commitment from senior leadership, they had equity related metrics built into the executive incentive plan. And then Brigham and Women's Hospital, they were able to build the infrastructure to support health equity by providing over $100,000 for equity projects via their health equity innovation matching program. So that goes back to one of the core components that I shared on how to create the infrastructure and to be able to support equity work. And then Henry Ford Health System, they were able to address multiple determinants of health by addressing food scarcity and transportation for their patients with end-stage renal disease. So they were able to implement some care coordination processes to support their patients in that way. And then I want to come back to Brigham and Women's Hospital and go a little bit deeper here on one example of how they specifically eliminated racism and other forms of oppression. So they noticed that there was a lack of um, groups who were underrepresented in medicine, and specifically people of color, within their faculty and residents. And so as they noticed that, they had a theory that perhaps there may be implicit bias and explicit bias at play there. And so what they also knew is that there were some kind of under the radar recruitment concepts. So when they would screen for residents, they would look for things like applicants who were able to speak with erudite diction or were trained in elite institutions or demonstrated fit with the organization. And they know that all of those were rooted in discriminatory practices that typically kept people of color out from being able able to access those institutions. And so they wanted to learn a little bit more about what was happening there. So they sent out a survey to the residency program applicants, and they heard in the responses that they experienced a lack of diversity among the faculty and residents, and that they didn't sense that diversity was actually emphasized in their institution. And as Don mentioned before, it's important also for our patients to be able to perhaps see a physician who looks like them. And so the Department of Medicine there um, started to um, require all faculty who participated in interviewing the residency applicants to participate in implicit bias training before doing so. And they also created a Department of Medicine Resident Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And two members from that committee also began to review all residency applications from those in those underrepresented in medicine groups from communities of color to make sure that there were no highly qualified applicants that slipped through the cracks. And as a result of their efforts, they were able to increase the number of residents from those different groups. And they're still working to do that with their faculty. So that's just a little bit more in-depth example of how they were able to apply that in their system. And then lastly, Mainline Health was able to partner with the community to improve health equity by developing trusted relationships and partnerships with a variety of community organizations so that they were able to maximize impact and improvements in the areas of health, education, food access, and opportunity. So here's just a few examples of this one, this framework, how it actually plays out and how you might be able to consider applying some of these concepts within your work. So Don, I'll pass it back to you to take us home. Okay, thank you, Shannon. I, I, I rarely uh, uh, toot my own organization's horn, but I have to say this is before you came to uh, IHI, Shannon, but 15 years or so ago when I came, uh, there was one black person in all of IHI. And uh, I have to say, not only has IHI become extraordinarily committed to equity uh, globally, uh, but it's a much more diverse organization with still a long way to go, but uh, definitely on a journey. And I, I'm so, so proud of uh, IHI for having uh, done that. Uh, so I'm going to just focus for a minute on one really obvious uh, and, and ubiquitous uh, disparity and inequity, and that's uh, maternal mortality in the United States. Now, I can tell you this is not just the United States problem, as you'll see, uh, but in the U.S., uh, maternal mortality ratio, which is the way it's calculated, uh, is over 17 per 100,000 pregnancies, uh, which uh, leads to 660 maternal deaths 
which may not seem a lot, but it's it, it's a lot for the women who endure this. And it's only uh, the ultimate outcome of a lot of other bad outcomes that black women uh, undergo during uh, childbirth and, and that thereafter. Uh, importantly, U.S. is the last overall among all industrialized uh, countries or uh, high income uh, nations, which is a total embarrassment. Maternal mortality ratio for black women is two and a half times the ratio for white women, which is just astonishing. One of the most dramatic uh, disparities uh, in the U.S. And, and what really brought this home to me is a college. We always say education really helps, right? College educated black mom is at 60 percent greater risk than a white uh, woman with less than a high school education. Being smart, being educated doesn't protect you. Uh, and uh, more than a half of the deaths occur uh, uh, after the day of birth, often months later, what we now call the fourth trimester. And you can imagine uh, the structural issue, the, the nature of the healthcare system, the community outreach that would be important in preventing late deaths uh, in those mothers. And unfortunately and regrettably, in the United States, there's enormous variation depending on where you live. If you're in California, the disparity has actually been uh, shrinking a little bit and the rate has gone down. If you live in the south of the United States, it's even higher. So uh, you can draw your own conclusions about those regional uh, differences, but they're certainly striking. Uh, I, I like to talk about uh, Serena Williams. I don't know if you're all familiar with the story. It just shows that fame is not an antidote to racism and inequity. Uh, she had a cesarean delivery and was known to have uh, thromboembolic disease previously and was on anticoagulants. Uh, following a surgery, she complained of symptoms, shortness of breath and pain, which she attributed possibly to having had an embolic event and having thrombosis. And she begged uh, for people to pay attention to this and do an ultrasound, do a CT. And it was dismissed. It was just not taken seriously until it became so dire that people finally did an ultrasound and then a CT that showed that she, she had, in fact, pulmonary emboli. She'd been coughing so hard uh, with, with this uh, pulmonary embolus situation that she ruptured a cesarean uh, wound, which had to be repaired. And in the process that they found that because she was uh, now finally put on uh, anticoagulant, she had a large collection of blood in her abdomen. And it was a very long and difficult recovery. Uh, and what this brought home to me uh, is seen in a number of studies that I'm not gonna go into today, treating women, regardless of their race, the color of their skin, their ethnicity, with respect. Mothers report, black mothers especially, report not being treated with respect, not being taken seriously. And we have these enduring medical myths, even among residents uh, in the United States, the uh, junior doctors, you should call them in the UK and elsewhere, uh, that blacks have thicker skin, that they endure more pain with no problem. And you can imagine what that leads to. We've got to undo those myths. That's something we can do and should do uh, as a matter of some uh, priority. This is the global situation, as bad as it is in the United States compared to these European countries. Look at Africa and some other parts of the world where uh, the mortality rate is much, much higher. So this is a global inequity. We always got to keep this in mind. We are part of the globe. In the United States, we tend to think of global as being somewhere else out there. Uh, but no, we're part of the globe and need to take responsibility for uh, the globe. So why would anybody be surprised, given everything I've told you, uh, how great the disparities were in COVID-19, rates of infection, rates of hospitalization, and, and death. Pe people say, well, this is shocking. What is, it's no surprise. Anybody could have predicted this. And in fact, uh, what happened was uh, really uh, dramatic. Uh, and here you can see uh, some data. I'm not going to read uh, through it. You can look at these slides, which will be posted uh, when you have time. But basically, whether you lived in Chicago, Louisiana, Michigan, wherever you live in the United States, if you were black, if you were part of a marginalized population, uh, you had a disproportionate level of infection. You had disproportionately less testing. You had di disproportionately more time in hospitals and ICUs, and you tended to die disproportionately. Here's some uh, more recent data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. You can see that black people uh, have uh, actually narrowed the gap uh, in terms of getting uh, uh, COVID. This is uh, progress, I think, but hospitalizations and deaths still are disproportionate. But we can't lose sight of other populations. Look at the 
Hispanic or Latino, or as we now say, Latinx population, which is now doing even less well than the black uh, population. I saw a recent study in the journal Health Affairs from California that demonstrated that the very large Latinx population of California has done disproportionately much worse than even black population uh, when it comes to COVID-19, whether or not they were tested, whether they had a positive test, whether they were hospitalized. There are many other factors apart from race that contribute to this list. Um, obviously, if you have obesity, diabetes, asthma, other pre-existing conditions, you're more likely to have a bad outcome. And I've listed some other things uh, here as well. Uh, it was interesting in that California study I mentioned, uh, being an essential healthcare worker, living in a crowded house, having hourly wage jobs, all of those were associated with increased COVID risk. So these other things are important. But what I heard people say towards the start of this epidemic and still hear some people say, well, those black people, they have obesity and diabetes and all those asthma pre-existing conditions. And so, of course, they're getting more COVID and they're doing worse. Well, ask yourself, why do they have more obesity? Why more diabetes? Why more asthma? It's all of those things we talked about before about well, where they live, uh, what they have to endure in the environment and so forth and so on that leads to those pre-existing conditions that in turn uh, make the outcomes uh, worse. This is just data that uh, I'm not going to go into the state by state analysis of vaccination uh, for COVID. And basically, uh, the, the differences in each of these states is where uh, black people would be if they were vaccinated at the same rate as white people. And you can see wherever you look, especially in the south of the United States, uh, the gaps are enormous. Later, you can study in detail, the gaps are narrowing. That's what these data are from just uh, the other day, but they're still uh, underrepresented in uh, vaccine uh, administration. Uh, now, now, there's some interesting developments. I'm always looking to say, well, don't have your assumptions be the overriding uh, determinant of what you think. And here you see uh, vac so-called vaccine hesitancy. These are people who say in the orange, I'm not gonna get vaccinated. And you see for all adults in the United States, about 30% and shrinking. For black people now, due to a lot of good, finally, communication from uh, black leaders, from black athletes, from uh, different messaging, black people, I, I'm, I see by these data, and I'm told by my colleagues, are being much more accepting of vaccine. Look, look, look who is not. Uh, so Republican men, people voted for the former guy, uh, white men without college degrees, uh, evangelical Christians and so forth. I'm not saying one way or the other. I think I'm open to hear people's point of view and where they come from and all that. But it's become obvious now that the, 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 the situation is uh, shifting. I didn't want to leave out Europe, this European forum. Here's England, you guys. OK, you got disparities, too. Look at where you live. Uh, and what your uh, uh, COVID rate is going to be. Uh, I don't know. I, I spent a year in England. I should know better. I, I don't know what all these communities are, but I can tell you that they're uh, more likely to be industrialized and uh, left behind uh, communities where a, a lot of people of color uh, live. Uh, here you can see some data on Britain. Uh, males are, are not, not doing as well as females in all the data I look at. And I don't know if that's got to do with their habits or uh, predisposition. I, I'm not going to go there. Today's not a gender discussion. But what you can see, uh, black British people are not doing as well as uh, white people. When you look at mortality, uh, Asian people and mixed uh, ethnic groups also aren't doing as well as white people. I ignore the other. That's a, a data issue that I'm not going to try and explain to you today. So uh, remember, I talked to you about levels of multifactorial action. I see that we're at the uh, 45 minute mark here. And so I'm not going to go into this in detail. You will have the slides where for each of these level, I give you uh, multiple examples of what could be done if you want to work in the community, if you want to work in your microsystem, if you're a government person, want to work on policy and payment, there's something there for all of you. It isn't perfect. It's stuff I came up with based on what my reading is and what I, I think I've learned. But study that at your leisure. Find yourself in those levels of action. Ask yourself, if I'm working at the 
um, macro system level. I'm a hospital leader, a uh, trust leader. What are my colleagues doing in the community? What, what are my doctors doing in their office? Uh, what is my government doing uh, in the NHS or in the German system, wherever you happen to be? All of this is informed by stratified data. And I'll just close by saying, I'm all for stratified data, but it's really complicated. Do I really want to stratify data by race, socially determined constructs? Some of my friends say, shouldn't do that. Do it by racism. I, I don't know as an individual that I'm a racism. I'm a victim, a subject of racism if I'm black. So it, doing this is really tough. And more and more people are either saying, I'm not putting it down. I'm other, I'm mixed. And it's just getting harder and harder to do this right. But if you don't ask, if you don't let people self-identify, if you're not interested in the United States, if they're African-American came here with enslaved people uh, from Africa versus a Somali recently arrived, if you're not asking, uh, are you a Muslim Arab uh, immigrant uh, or, or not? If you're not asking those questions, you can't begin to deal with all those isms, let alone racism. So I'm gonna close here and thank Shannon for helping me on this journey. And we're always available. We love to talk to folks and there's more on the slides I didn't show today and please take a look. Thank you.